Bernard Arnault, an art collector, pianist, and among other things, the current chairman of the LVMH Group, a global fashion company who owns 75 luxury maisons, better known as fashion houses, making the company the leading player in global fashion and luxury. All this has happened in less than 40 years and has seen Arno consolidate the fragmented luxury goods market into a slick corporate machine worth over $250 billion. Let's take a look at how Bernard Arno built LVMH into the house of luxury. It all started in 1949 when Arno was born in Roubaix, an industrial city in the north of France. After completing his education as an engineer at one of France's most prestigious schools, École Polytechnique, he joined the family construction business in 1971, convincing his father to enter into the real estate market, which provided the capital to springboard his business career. Arno visited America in 1971 and spotted the power that a luxury brand could have after asking a New York taxi driver what he knew about France. The taxi driver did not know who the president was, but he knew about Dior, the, the Parisian fashion house founded in 1946 by Christian Dior. As fate would have it, Arnaud's mother, Marie, had a fascination with the company, wearing their Diorismo scent throughout her life. Arnaud had an idea to create a luxury group, which he was heavily criticised for, with people telling him that the idea didn't make sense. However, this did not put him off. In 1984, he lobbied the French government to let him take control of the near-bankrupt textile company Boussac, who owned Christian Dior. Arnaud bought the company for just one franc, promising that jobs would be saved. However, within five years, he had sold off nearly all their assets, except for Dior and department store Le Bon Marché, and fired 8,000 workers, despite his promises to the government. In 1987, Louis Vuitton, merged with champagne producer Moe and Chandon, who owned a number of other champagne brands including Dom Perignon and Verve Clicquot, and merged with spirit producer Hennessy in a, in a $4 billion deal that put Arno on course to create the world's largest luxury brand. He engineered a majority stake in the group by merging the companies and ousting Louis Vuitton's president, Henri Ronsomier, from his own family business after being invited to buy more shares in the company, which eventually gave him a majority. Arno deployed similar tactics in other mergers, removing founders and causing divisions between shareholders. This has seen him nicknamed the Wolf in Kashmir due to his ruthless approach to deal making. Only Hermes and Givenchy managed to prevent Arno's strategies to take complete control, but he still made millions from their brands. But more on that later. Louis Vuitton has become the jewel in the crown of the group, becoming the tenth most valuable brand in the world, according to Forbes. In 1988, LVMH began to expand, purchasing Givenchy for $450 million after founder Hubert de Givenchy opted to sell out and focus on other ventures. However, under the contract, he could remain creative director for as long as he wanted. In 1997, the group purchased makeup and beauty care specialist Sephora, which now has a number of concessions in department stores around the world, and also purchased fashion company Marc Jacobs. In 1999, LVMH made its first foray into the world of luxury watches, acquiring the Tag Heuer Group for $739 million. The deal in included brands such as Zenith, who made movements for Rolex and Hublot. Every company that was acquired has kept its original name while operating under the LVMH umbrella. This gives Arno and his team the freedom to refine brands and refresh their image, whilst maintaining their heritage and customer base. Running individual brands has also kept customers loyal, giving LVMH larger market share and withholding each company's reputation of quality. Arno's biggest rival is fashion house Kering, who own Gucci, Yves Saint Laurent, Balenciaga and a number of other fashion houses. Francois Pinault, the founder, has battled with Arno in the luxury world before. In 1999, the two battled for Gucci, which has caused significant friction. After Arno aggressively bought shares in the company, he was offered the chance to buy a majority stake for $85 million. He refused, allowing Gucci's owners to sell to Financier Pino, who bought 40% of the company for $75 a share, diluting LVMH's shares and blocking their attempts to buy the company. This is the only time that Arno has been thwarted in the attempts to buy a majority shareholding in a luxury brand. 
after the failure to buy Gucci, Arno targeted MAs, slowly purchasing shares over the course of a decade. In 2010, LVMH announced that it had acquired over 14% of Hermes shares using derivatives so that it did not have to disclose their holding. Patrick Thomas, the then CEO of Hermes, declared the move was like trying to seduce a woman while raping her from behind. A number of legal battles have resulted in Arno relinquishing his $7.5 billion holding in 2014. However, he used the profits from the sale of Hermes to tighten his grip on Dior, buying out a number of minority shareholders who held 26% of the company. Arno is not afraid of working with other fashion brands as well, teaming up with Prada in a joint venture to outbid Gucci to secure a 51% stake in the fashion house Fendi for $545 million, which was run by the late Karl Lagerfeld. Prada agreed to sell its stake to LVMH for $265 million in 2002. They also acquired DKNY, but that was sold to G3 Apparel Group for $650 million in 2016. In 2011, LVMH agreed a $5.2 billion deal to acquire a controlling stake in Bulgari, the Italian jewellery house, giving the group greater exposure to the watch industry that was and still is dominated by the Richemont Group. A landmark $16.2 billion deal coveted Tiffany & Co was agreed in 2019, although later attempts to cancel the deal due to Tiffany's handling of the pandemic did occur. Despite making a $32 million loss, Tiffany paid out over $70 million in dividends to shareholders, with LVMH declaring that the jeweller was a highly profitable luxury brand that no longer existed. The deal was eventually resolved, with LVMH paying $131.50 per share instead of the previously arranged $135 per share. Acquiring Tiffany has doubled LVMH's revenue from hard goods, which is the smallest of its five segments, helping it to compete with the Richemont Group a major watch conglomerate who own Jaeger Lacoutre, Panerai and Cartier, among others. LVMH plans to expand Tiffany's further into Europe and Asia and update their current stores. The group also plan to increase the jewellery and watch offerings that the firm produce. After Tiffany was hit by the pandemic, Fenty, a fashion brand launched in conjunction with the Renner, was also hit hard. As consumers have switched to more timely luxury names, Fenty's clothing line has struggled. Priced aggressively for a streetwear brand, it failed to take off. However, LVMH will continue to work with the pop star on her lingerie and makeup lines that is sold through makeup store Sephora. The company has also diversified over the years into yachts, acquiring Princess Yachts in 2008 for £200 million and spending $3.2 million for luxury hospitality group Belmont, which operates a number of hotels, trains and river cruises around the world. When asked to define luxury... Arno is not a fan of the word, as it is flamboyant and associated with showing off. In his world, a better definition is a combination of creativity and quality that the LVMH group has focused on to create the most innovative products possible. A combination of modernity and timelessness makes individual products successful over time. A key to the company's success was the move to China, being the first to open a luxury shop in the country in the basement of the Palace Hotel in 1992. At that point... There were more bicycles than cars on the road. But since then, China has driven luxury spending, with the region becoming the largest market for the LVMH group, accounting for just over 40% of global revenue. LVMH's teams look for future problems such as crises that the company can take advantage of. The company carries little debt and is prepared to acquire new businesses to add to their growing portfolio. This even involves buying shares of their own company when the prices fall. The battle is all about patience and not to buy when prices are high. Arno recognises this, that as prices fall, people are more willing to sell. Many of the products the group produce keep their exclusivity as production is suspended once a product hits the sales target, increasing demand and ensuring prices remain high on the second-hand market, whilst not needing to have sales or sell at discounted outlets. The company creates new products and ranges that customers follow, rather than marketing products and analysing the data to adapt to new product lines. Much of this design is done with long-term focus to keep customers interested in the brands for generations. There is also a focus on innovation, utilising new technologies such as optical fibres to create light-up Louis Vuitton bags and personalised lipstick cases. The takeover of already innovative businesses such as Remoa in 2017 
or a pioneer of electronic bag tags which use Bluetooth only adds to the desirability of their products. Despite their innovations, not all of LVMH's products are thousands of dollars to purchase. They allow customers to buy into the dream of luxury from as little as $20 for a tube of lipstick, unlike many other brands who try to remain exclusive and maintain high prices across the board. However, counterfeit products have been a rising issue for the group just despite their low entry prices, especially for the more exclusive and expensive items such as Louis Vuitton handbags and duffel bags. The company spends around $100 million a year to stop these fake products being sold. But without help from local authorities, it will be difficult to completely eradicate the counterfeit goods being sold around the world. People also question whether Louis Vuitton covers the losses from less successful companies owned by the group, and opponents are quick to highlight that individual company profits are not reported in company accounts. For example, Marc Jacobs is currently loss-making, but we don't know about other brands under the Arno umbrella. And, as LVMH has grown in size, The company has become reliant on acquisitions to fund growth and has not launched a new fashion house since Christian Lacroix in 1987. Maybe this could help the company in the future. Despite being over 70, Arno is still hungry for deals, suggesting that the company is just getting started. However, the question remains, how many more brands can LVMH acquire with increasing competition in the marketplace? Further expansion into jewellery and watches certainly seems an option with so many other rivals in these sectors. Another question is that of succession and is a taboo subject among the company's top management despite all of Arno's children being involved in the family businesses. Succession will occur according to abilities and skills but Arno refuses to say which one of his children will succeed him. Either way, time will tell if Arno can build LVMH into an even more expansive luxury empire. Whoever does inherit the position will have big shoes to fill in order to continue the stratospheric growth of the company in recent years. As the company has risen, Arno has built his wealth to over $150 billion and owns 47% of the group, making him the world's third richest person, according to Forbes. Not bad for a man who took a near-bankrupt textiles company to a global fashion and luxury house with sales of $54 billion in 2020. Whether this growth continues in the coming years, Arno's success shows that money can be made by investing and buying household names, refreshing their image and products to reap the future long-term rewards. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider smashing that like button and subscribing. And why not leave a comment on what you'd like to see next?